Okay, hello, hello everybody, and welcome to the first lecture here at the PIA of 2024. So I wish you all the very best for the rest of the year. Uh, today, Murat Akar is going to give a lecture to us, but first some uh, rules and regulations, if you want to call it that way. So the video and the audio is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube and will be shared uh, there and uh, later also. Uh, video, audio, the audience, says video and audio is off by default. And we would like you to use the Q&A uh, button to ask questions, which we will then afterwards, after the lecture, we will um, then make sure that uh, the host will read it. Um, you are, of course, very welcome to introduce yourself uh, in the chat feature. And to make sure that everybody can see what you are writing, it is best to uh, select all panel panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your, what you are saying. Then, on to the business of the evening. Murat Akar is Associate Professor uh, at Hatay Mustafa Kemal University. He holds a BA from the Bilkent University Department of Archaeology and History of Art. Later, he moved to Metu, where he then uh, took settlement archaeology for his Master of Science. And his PhD is from the, uh, in Near Eastern Archaeology, is from the University of Firenze in Italy. Since 2016, uh, Murat is teaching at Hatay Mustafa Kemal University, Department of Archaeology. He also is the director of the Amuk Valley Regional Survey Project and of the excavations at Tel Akshana Alala. As if that's not enough, he is also a scientific advisor to the excavations of Toprak Hissar Hayuk, which is run by the uh, Hatay Archaeological Museum. Murat held research fellowships at Anamut and was also one of the ground holders of the BIA's emergency research facilitation grants after the earthquakes of last February. <laughs> His research focuses on second millennium BC Anatolia, the Near East and the Levant, and his topics of uh, include architecture, memory, and also landscape studies, of course, in line with his field work. His current research addresses the role of climate in the long Longueuil. Today, he is going to talk about us about um, the contradictory to uh, topic, uh, concepts of reserving the past on the one hand and digging it up on the other hand, which uh, and thereby destroying the uh, underground archive. Therefore, archaeology, archaeologists are constantly facing quest, questions such as where to dig and where to stop digging, what to preserve and what not to, which is, of course, per definition, also subjective. In addition, he is also going to, uh, to, those, to those contradictory concepts, he is also going to talk to us about the additional challenge that the preservation of severely damaged mud brick monuments uh, in Tel Achana Alalak is causing them after the earthquakes. So, Murat, the floor is yours. We are very much looking forward to the lecture. Okay, I guess it's working, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, good evening, dear colleagues, friends, and everyone uh, who is here with us online. Uh, I would like to give my sincere thanks to Ricardo Vanderput for her kind invitation. Uh, but I wish I was here with a, obviously completely a different topic. I also would like to give my sincere thanks to uh, BIA's immediate response to provide academic and financial support to scholars from the earthquake zone with their emergency research facilitation grant. This was an important and a heartful contribution, and I would like to give my special thanks to BIA community for their kindness and hospitality in tough times. 
This talk is quite important from our perspective to outreach as many of you as we can with a certain motivation to not to forget the earthquake that happened in southeastern Turkey and northern Syria resulted with the death of over 60,000 people almost a year ago. The earthquake lasted only for two and a half minutes, but I foresee challenging conditions for the next five to 10 years at the earthquake impacted cities, particularly in Antakya. Today, I'm here to talk about the earthquake and what happened afterwards from the standpoint of Telachana, the capital city of the second millennium BC kingdom of Mukish. I will try to avoid talking about the Antakya city center as it is beyond my expertise. However, in the questions section, I can express my personal opinions and give you updates on the current condition as I was there just a few weeks ago. With this talk, I want to give an overview of our combined humanitarian and heritage preservation efforts. And I would like to begin by providing a synopsis of what happened in February 6th from our personal perspective. And then I would like to continue with our earthquake damage assessment and response plan now in action at Tarachana. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to a number of institutions and individual donors. This includes the Turkish Ministry of Culture and Tourism, Turkish Historical Society, Turkish National Science Foundation, American Society of Overseas Research, Oxford University Wainwright Grant Program, BAA, and many of the individual donors who supported our post-earthquake efforts. These grants allowed us to operate at an earthquake zone in tough times. This meant a lot, not only from funding perspectives, but also for raising global awareness and recognition. But let me see how to do this. Switch this place. I guess, is it working now? Yes, now. Tamam, okay. So, that's fine. Uh, in, it's working, right? Okay. So, to continue, in February 6th, an earthquake of 7.8 magnitude impacted 11 cities in southeastern Turkey and northern Syria severely. This is followed by another earthquake of 7.6 magnitude, only nine after hours, an extremely unusual natural phenomenon along the East Anatolian fault. A third 6.3 magnitude Antakya-based earthquake, 14 days later, was bolstered by 30,000 aftershocks. These aftershocks that still continue are no longer possessing a threat, but they're horrible to experience again and again for people who went through uh, the earthquake leading to major psychological traumas. The overall effects are at a drastic level. And even though I will show a few images in this presentation, there is no way to comprehend the scale of destruction without physically sensing and experiencing the post-earthquake environment, particularly at Antakya, where we witness to the destruction and now the demolishment of an entire city. I'm still shocked every time that I go to the city center and I can easily say that the region witnessed to one of the largest earthquake related destructions and I can say in the world. According to official records, over 50,000 people in Turkey and 3,000 people in Syria died with hundreds and thousands injured. From historical to modern buildings, nothing survived. And in the earthquake impacted cities, over 90,000 buildings were reported to be heavily damaged. And now all are in the process of demolition. This is certainly a massive undertaking for the Turkish government and it will have major socio-political and economic impacts in the long run. Among the earthquake impacted cities in Hatay, 
we saw the most dramatic destruction, particularly in Antakya, Samanda, Kırkan, and Iskenderun. It will take many years for these places to recover from this event, and nothing will be the same afterwards. So in many ways, what we experienced in Hatay is the end of an era, and sadly, it is irreversible. Cities, of course, will be rebuilt, but buildings are nothing without their social and cultural identities. Antakya will have a new constructed identity, and this is what many people from outside the earthquake zone are mostly worried about. I rather find this very obscure since the people that still live in Antakya, their major concerns are more on having decent living conditions. The morning of the earthquake in a city shattered into pieces with thousands of dead bodies and much more severely injured, it was simply chaos. There was no electricity. The roads were closed to deep cracks or collapsed buildings. People had no chance but to wait to be rescued in the next five days in an unsafe environment where humanity was lost and petty crime was everywhere. All the markets and pharmacies were emptied out in the first days, and that is perfectly normal in such conditions. But only a few hours after the earthquake, banks and shops with high value products were also being looted. And unfortunately, gangs of burglars came down to Hatay, particularly to Antakya, pretending to be volunteers to work in certain rescue operations and they were even stealing ornaments, personal ornaments from dead bodies. The scenery was post-apocalyptic, showing all the brutal aspects of the humankind. We were privileged to have a fully functional archaeological research center established under the umbrella of Terrachana excavations, just 20 kilometers outside the city center. However, it took some time to reach there through alternative village roads, since the major highway was completely damaged with massive cracks and fallen vehicles. Our research center was not damaged and played a crucial role in this period of natural disaster and turned into an operational center for humanitarian support during the first months. This owes much to previous director Aslan Ziener's vision of having a full-time operational research center. Living and conducting research in the same city enabled us to fulfill this vision since the center was equipped with, to operate in winter conditions with a heating system, a fully functional kitchen, and a generator. The earthquake happened in the coldest and the heaviest rainy days of Hatay. A generator was probably the most precious piece of equipment that allowed us to heat one building where we accommodated up to 40 people during those chaotic first five days. Our cellar had some food and we had some petrol to operate the generator, but obviously it was not enough for that many people. So we did several trips, ended up getting into conflicts to get to acquire petrol and then went back into our apartments to get more food as we didn't know what to expect in the coming five days. This event taught us the potential of the research centers or dig houses in conventional terms, as they are often located outside the city centers or urban areas and have an extremely important value in such circumstances. So here I strongly advise to all project directors, especially those conducting research in Turkey, that they should be aware of natural disasters and ready to respond to period of crisis with their well-established facilities. In the first five days, we were one of the very few places in the earthquake zone that actually managed to operate effectively. In the coming weeks, we concentrated on developing an urgent action plan. While we were struggling with circumstances, circumstances at the impact zone, our team member, Helen Malen, initiated an earthquake disaster relief campaign. Same efforts were given 
by Tal Kurdu and Tal Tainab excavation team members as well. And during these hard times, all teams were united to effectively use the fundings rise from these campaigns. By doing so, we were able to provide containers, tents, food, and medical supplies to people, especially those we were connected to. Since much of this humanitarian support was prioritized for people living in the city center, we decided to help our community, the villagers that we have been interacting and working over the last 20 years as part of our archaeological research program. And also, we were able to, through these funds, uh, provide funding for, right, uh, for scholarships to our students. The next step was to establish a damage assessment. Telechana and Teltainat are located along the fault line. And in fact, the major damage that occurred along the major highway is roughly one kilometer to both of these sites. Both at Telechana and Teltainat, there was no major damage occurred except for a few sections being collapsed in our new excavation areas. Whereas the standing monuments that were exposed by the British archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley during 1930s, these locations were severely damaged. The Middle Bronze Age remains, which include the Level 7 Palace and the Gateway, and the Late Bronze Age level, is the Level 4 Palace, were badly damaged. As a supra-regional phenomenon extending along the borders of the Orontes, Euphrates, and Tigris river systems, Middle Bronze Age is marked by monumental scale construction programs reflecting the complexity issue in the use of space and the symbolic representation of the prestige and power of autonomous cities and kingdoms. This was best observed at Alava through 1930s excavations yielding a continuous Middle Bronze Age occupation with a peak reached at level seven reflected itself in the formation of spaces of administration, power, and prestige. The level seven palace with its remarkable resemblance to the palaces such as at Ebla clearly reflects a local Northwest Syrian Amorite building tradition, but also revealed peculiar findings also reflecting the early stages of internationalism to its location at a transitory buffer zone. Just to give a few examples, this include the two unique sculptural pieces that reveal both local and sometimes Egyptian influences, as well as a workshop dedicated to the production of uh, stone vessels influenced influence from both Aegean and Egyptian counterparts, and revealed a series of workshops dedicated to ivory production, best reflected by the presence of both the tusks and a rich collection of ivories. The appearance of wall paintings at Alala, Katna, Mari, Tel Kabri, Tel Saka, Tel Burak, Tel El Daba, are generally accepted as a product of Mediterranean koine and look through a very fixed egocentric perspective. But the recent archaeological research at Alala now also shed clues on the dual origins and early development of wall painting practices in the Near East. And certainly, from a historical perspective, the tablets from the Level 7 Palace provide an incredibly rich source of epigraphic material, first to identify the site, the name, <coughs> And to produce and to proceed with matters on land tenure, taxation, and king's ways of exchanging things, including the cities. The texts also remarkably emphasize the significance of the agro products, such as olive oil and wine, pointing to the close relationship between the economic richness of the kingdom to the region's ecological variety. <coughs> Unfortunately, exposed over a century ago and already in fragile condition, the burnt mud brick walls of the 18th century BC Middle Bronze Age palace walls were collapsed 
stone orthostats were dislocated from their original location and shattered into pieces. Royal Hatijain was badly damaged. Before the earthquake, the work, work was already in progress for the restoration of the level seven palace. Just a few months before the incident, most of the area was cleaned from vegetation and mud brick decay to get ready for a much larger restoration project. So here is a comparative view of the area to get a better sense of the destruction occurred at the Middle Bronze Age Palace. Another urban expansion era at Alala was defined with the construction of the Level 4 Palace in the 15th century BC, with the palace built by King Igrimi, a prototype to Bitilani with its stepped and colon colonnaded entrance. The building was witness to a massive burning event in the past, and like the Middle Bronze Age Palace, the presence of a cuneiform archive allowed to understand the societal changes observed uh, from the shift from the Amorite rule dynasty to Mitannian controlled kingdom of Mukish. The roof partially covering the level four palace was also damaged in some parts. And although still standing, all the welding points were broken and it became a potential threat to what was left behind underneath. The Ministry of Culture was informed about the damage Summer excavation plans were modified to only perform a restoration project, and several grant applications were submitted to initiate an earthquake response project as quickly as possible. No authorities expected us to deal with the consequent challenges of being in the field in the earthquake zone, as most of our team members, including me and my family, were in fact survivors from this disaster. However, our reasoning to immediate response was not only related to heritage preservation, but also it was an act to provide a healthy and a safe environment to our students who were traumatized due to loss of their core family members, relatives, friends, houses, and their city. So we took the responsibility of protecting them through assuring scholarships, but most importantly, by doing field work, we have provided them something to hold on to. So archeology span for us was rehabilitation. In a city that was lost, this created deeper bonds with the site and with a group of dedicated members. But all that damage, was it just the earthquake? To answer that, we need to go to the colonial backgrounds of our discipline when sustainable heritage was not a topic of consideration and the scale of excavations were massive in comparison to today's archeological standards. Leonard Woolley was able to expose, as I said, two extremely well-preserved palace complexes from Middle and Late Bronze Ages, the city's gate complex, any stratigraphical sequence through his deep soundings. This exposure roughly covered one third of the site. In modern archeological standards, this is a task to accomplish with centuries of excavations. So in that respect, the, the irony is hidden behind the contradictory state of the available data. Accepting the fact that these results of these early campaigns added a new vision on how we interpret and see interaction between different geographical and cultural zones, in the last 80 years of archeological research history of Alala, the work that was done by Woolley provoked an ongoing debate on site stratigraphy and its chronological integration into the wider setting of the ancient Middle East. Hundreds of articles were written on the subject and we also dedicated more than 20 years to this dilemma. And this occupied our major research agenda. But at the same time, Bully left a huge exposed area. And this led us to question how sustainable heritage can be created and presented in heritage sites excavated in the colonial era. 
remnants of the past are meant to decay, and this decomposition process forms the archaeological landscapes of Anatolia, the Near East, and the Levant. So thousands of tell sites became nothing but abandoned human spaces, and they decomposed once deserted. And so how can we cope with this process of decay? After the reactivation of the archaeological research at the site in 2000, the site was already exposed to all natural conditions for 70 years, and the previous director, Aslihan Yener, has spent a lot of energy to preserve the site and raise cultural heritage awareness. However, this became a challenging task since we have been working at a conflict zone along the Turkish-Syrian border, where priorities of local authorities change rapidly from day to day due to impacts of civil war in Syria, followed by the Turkish military intervention in Afrin. It was also challenging to explain to local community the significance of the site or the standing monuments as they were decayed, completely infested with wild vegetation. On the other hand, Hatay's heritage is mostly known by its famous Roman and Byzantine era mosaics, and its richer and deeper history was never taken into consideration. The reconstruction of the palaces at Hatay Archaeological Museum led some degree of understanding the earlier time periods, but such presentations were only limited to the museum installations, and there was no interest on understanding, preserving, and presenting heritage sites in their own location. And unfortunately, Wuli's very attractive title of Forgotten Kingdom has become our reality. Over the last years, economic impacts of the civil war in Syria, the worldwide pandemic and inflation rates in Turkey also affected the project dramatically. But taking the advantage of moving to Antakya, meaning longer field work seasons, we decided to take action as we finally accepted the reality that there won't be any local support in the near future, which is actually the most important factor for sustainable heritage. After the recent earthquakes, establishing a response plan for the site and bringing forward issues on resilient heritage has become a necessity. 1930s excavation area did not survive the haste of environmental impacts over the last century. All the exposed monuments were decayed and infected with an extremely deep-rooted wild plant called Spinoza farta. And in my world, I called this the plant of immortality. And you'll understand what I mean in the next few slides. For a visitor's eyes, there was no way to comprehend what all the bumps in the woolly excavation area mean and what it looks like to live in a Bronze Age city. This also leads to a process of forgetting in many levels, thus the site was regarded as many of the other site, tell sites in Turkey or the Near East, where archaeologists perform archaeological research with no attraction to public audience, therefore no need for long-term heritage preservation. This is certainly due to the nature of the building material. Mud brick architecture is fragile, and once it's exposed, there is no way to provide long-term protection unless it is isolated from environmental stress. This was certainly not the case for Telechana, and our mission has turned into adopting several approaches to deal with almost a hundred years of monument decay. For several years now, we have been working on removing the collapsed mud brick detritus of the walls in the Middle and Late Bronze Age palaces that preserved what's left underneath to a certain extent. Once this was accomplished, the general layout of the buildings, as you see in this uh, photo, became understandable and a sense of space was created. However, cleaning walls from their erosion certainly means more exposure to environmental stress. Thus, a decision has been made to preserve the monuments through aid of environmentally friendly 
sustainable, and most importantly, reversible methods that can be helpful in both preservation and presentation of the site. At its first stage, this was achieved by simple methodology of mud, mud plastering. The walls with less than a meter of height were covered with geotextile. Blocking direct sunlight, this allowed not to kill, but at least to stop uncontrolled growth of wild plants. This layer of geotextile is then sealed by a thick layer of mud plastic. All of the open spaces were covered with fine gravel over geotextile, thus designated pathways were created. This simple treatment has already been exposed to heavy rainy winters and the earthquakes over the last two years. The sacrificial layer on top of the walls did its jump with no damage and a sense of Bronze Age space was created. But certainly such preservation methods require annual treatment and know-how and a collective effort that we don't want to limit only to excavation team members, but we would like to create a community engagement platform for a long-term preservation of the monuments. We also aim to keep urban architectural traditions alive through establishment of perhaps annual festivals for heritage embracement and preservation. With matters of faith, such practices are best known, for instance, with the annual plastering festival of the famous Mosque of Zenon, where collective community engagement is the key in preserving the monument for centuries. So the major question is then, how can we create such a model in preserving a 4,000 year old heritage site? Can we create strong bonds with the space and people and how can we raise earth and heritage awareness, especially at a region where thousands died under concrete buildings? This is a challenge that awaits us in the long run, especially in the coming years. While on the one hand, plastering applications were quite successful, some other monuments, such as the tripartite gate complex that was exposed in 1930s required much more difficult treatment strategies. In Anatolian archaeology, when we talk about city gates, the first thing that comes to our mind is, of course, Hattusha, the capital city of Hittites. However, this defensive architectural tradition, among with the use of complex stone masonry techniques, was influenced from Mesopotamia and Egypt. And Alala was one of these locations where Hittites experienced and were able to transfer knowledge through their early military campaigns in the region. The tradition of constructing tripartite gate complexes goes back er to early Middle Bronze Age in the region and seems to be well attested by Amorite kings, best represented with the exposures from Alala, Ebla, and Tilmanu. Excavating the guardian chamber on the western wing, Wooly did not excavate the western wing and he stopped at the late bronze one level where he exposed the level four gate complex remains. So these two levels now show the remarkable changes observed in terms of city defenses. This monument was also, as you can imagine, completely decayed and infested with deeply rooted wild plants, it took weeks just to remove the plants to see what was sealed underneath. And once the entire surface was cleaned, we also realized that Wooly dumped all his excavation soil along the slopes of the cell, significantly altering the view of the site as well as the landscape. So as you can imagine, all the walls were collapsed and the removal of the mud brick detritus itself took a full fieldwork season. And once this was issued, it was clear that the monument required further and solid treatments. Thus, we began with the application of a mud brick capping project. And we already know that such a project would require 
building strongholds around the decayed walls. However, before the earthquake, we sealed the monument with a single row of mud bricks uh, by 20 by 40 centimeters in size with soil brought from elsewhere. The mud bricks were produced with soil brought from elsewhere. The idea was to visually present the potential of the site and to create public awareness in a limited time and budget. Unfortunately, this attempt was interrupted in the winter of 2023 with the earthquake, eventually leading to the collapse of the cap walls. The work we did included many flaws, mainly starting with the choice of raw materials, which we did not really think much about at the beginning. And we used soil that was brought from elsewhere in the valley with higher clay content. As part of this research, Onur Hassan Kirman, uh, one of my MA students and the field director at Telechana, acquired mud brick samples from all buildings from various levels, and those samples were subjected to ICPMS analysis for his thesis, and this is to be discussed elsewhere. But microscopically, the major distinction was the presence of a silty and a sandy matrix in the Middle Bronze Age mud bricks and a higher clay content in the late Bronze Age mud bricks. This, in accordance with our undisturbed sediment pouring project, proved that the Middle Bronze Age builders of Alala were using the flood deposits brought by the Orontes River throughout the Middle Bronze Age, and with the shift of the riverbed in time, mud bricks with higher clay content were noted for the late Bronze II complex. So in the summer of 2023, we decided to proceed with using soil from the site, thus woolies and our excavation dump can be converted into mud bricks. Middle Bronze Age silty mud bricks was the best choice to produce mud bricks and the results were satisfactory. Whereas mud bricks that we produced from late Bronze Age levels of soil turned out to be not very ideal. And woolly dumped masses of excavated soil, as I said, along the slopes of the Tal, and this became uh, our major operation area and a major source of raw material. But of course, all that material first had to be re-excavated, re-sifted, and laid out. For long-term preservation of the monument, approximately 4,500 mud bricks were produced at the site, and implemented. The change of the brick size to Bronze Age standards of 40 by 40 centimeters required tremendous amounts of raw material as well as physical endurance to deal with mud bricks weighing up to 30 kilo each. We collected our straw right after the hardwood season directly from the field. Water management was another major issue as we were carrying three tons of water daily by a tank equipped with a very long haul and a water pump, 200 kilograms of straw was used to produce a mud mixture of five tons, which was laid to rest for a day. Every evening, as a team, we went to the site and stepped in with bare foot to get the mud brick dough ready for the following days. Obviously, after weeks, the team was exact hours a day. And thanks to QTF excavation director, quickly clock all this much saver suggestion on the phone, we immediately purchased a mini oil machine to speed up the market production process. This was probably the most exciting purchase I had in my life, and that was a game changer for the entire mission. Lifting and laying matrix was another challenge due to the weight. Thus, our work routine was extremely heavy. We had some workers with us, but one of the challenges that awaits us in the long run will be the absence of labor, of course. Now that the entire city is a construction firm, everyone in the region prefers to work in these construction projects, and the daily weight is far above the realistic numbers 
that we can cope with as an archaeological expedition. So as you saw in all these images, we embrace a do-it-yourself philosophy. Everyone on the team physically contributed to the project. Everyone on the team contributed to this project and after weeks, this turned into a fight with extremely difficult field conditions. And without team's effort and dedication, this could have not been possible. And here you see uh, not all, but the active members uh, that did field work for up to eight months uh, during the field work of 2003. Eight months was a real challenge for us, I would say. Sealing the gate complex was another challenge, and to prevent further decay, decay or plant infestation, it also included all the top surfaces, which obviously meant producing more and more mud bricks to seal the entire surfaces. The work on the western section of the gate was more difficult because there was a significant elevation difference, and with higher eroded surfaces, which needed to be reinforced up to two meters of mud brick walls. So such a height required thicker walls of 1.20 centimeter wide. And while constructing the support walls, we were able to replicate the Middle Bronze Age wall construction techniques noted in the collapsed walls of the level seven palace. Every introduction to archaeology textbook talks about root destruction and how we need to record root contamination into our sheets. This is what happens when the site gets infested by wild plants and the web of roots basically covered the entire old excavation area. This photographs as a representative shows only a small portion of the roots remo removed from the gate complex and now turned into burning supplies for our workers uh, for winter times. These roots were also strong to push the orthostats of the gateway and dislocated them. And for that reason, we need to clean and put them back into their original location. We were not fully equipped for such tasks and bringing down light paints into this area, particularly at the town site, was quite problematic. So we did improvise by using a car lifter, which really works smoothly in the end. This is followed by mud plastering that will ensure the survival of the monument from heavy rainfall in winter times. And here is a view of the entrance from outside and plastering in progress. And here is the view from inside the city that allows us to visualize the relationship between the landscape and the city, looking down the hills and once surrounded by the Orontes River. The field season was finally completed just a month ago. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the remains of the late Bronze Age gate complex, a way to be preserved. And this is an area that we are hoping to work in 2024. Yet there is still a lot to do. The image shows the general layout of the late Bronze Age palace with its back rooms filled with mud brick decay and possibly excavation dump. And hopefully this is another area that we would like to concentrate in the coming years. This heritage initiative at Alala also allows us to get a better understanding of all these monuments excavated by Bully, as there were very limited number of photos in his publications from 1955. With the removal of the mud brick decay now, these beautiful orthostats covering the courtyard walls of the level seven palace were uncovered and documented for the first time. Finally, to briefly update on the archaeological collections, we have spent the afternoons working in our depot, which was badly affected by the earthquake. We were proud to follow a no discard policy and an extremely well organized depot thanks to Muge Bulu and Helen Moraine's work throughout the years. But sadly, we were not prepared for this. While reorganizing the depot, this time we took some new precautions. 
that include the reinforcements of the depot itself and using nets to prevent objects falling from their shelves. This was then followed by the relocation of Kinetics' own archaeological connection, collection to our research center, as the museum will be under repairs and reinforcements in the coming years. This was already planned with Kinetics' excavation director, Marie Henriette Gates, before the earthquake, with the intent to store all Hatay-related archaeological collections in our research center and make them accessible all year around. But with the earthquake, it kind of turned into a rescue operation. This relocation also included the archaeological collections of Topaki Sahiri, our sister project that we have been conducting in the Altamir Highlands since 2016. During these challenging times, we were also able to accommodate our colleagues working at Teltainat as their excavation house in the city center was also heavily damaged. Thus, their work in the summer of 2023 was dedicated to relocation and reorganization of their collections to be stored in two shipping containers located in the garden of our research center. Over the last seven years, we have been extensively working at Toprak Isahir rescue excavations in the highlands of Altmuzi. Most of this research is published in Anatolian studies and presented in BIA over the last two years. Thus, I also wanted to share with you the current condition of the site. Toprak Sarayuk has been under systematic destruction over the last 30 years with the construction of the Yarseri Dam, eroding almost half of the site, and with the expansion of the village on top with multiple sections being bulldozed and terrace for agricultural activities. This decomposition process is now accelerated with the earthquake, triggering massive landslides and erosion along the already damaged section of the site due to the dam construction. Hopefully we will return to the site in May and continue performing our research rescue excavations as with the large chunks of soil is now being collapsed, the site requires our urgent attention. Going back to the lowlands and sum up, Telachana is a perfect example to bring forward the concerns about the colonial backgrounds of, of our discipline when digging up the past thus performed in many ways without thinking of the future. And just like Telachana, Many of the tile sites were left to decay through hands of archaeology. So the concept of digging up the past and preserving the past are contradictory in many ways and require individual and institutional agendas to be reformatted to create a sustainable and resilient heritage, especially at a city that is heavily impacted by recent earthquakes. That is a complicated task, and I'm not sure how much our discipline is sensitive to this particular problem. And finally, I would like to conclude my talk with this beautiful ivory furniture fragment that came from our recent work at the Temple District from a level dated to the end of late Bronze Age. This is a marvelous example of a hybridized artwork that seemed to be produced in a time period of massive environmental, political, and cultural stress leading to the formation of new political and cultural identities in the Iron Age, making this object a product of Brazilian community. I wish to foresee the same process for today's Hatay and particularly Antakya, as it is time not to hope for a return to the past, but to construct a new future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and also thank you for um, ending your talk with a message of hope. I think that's very important uh, in the earthquake area and beyond. Um, I think that probably the majority of the questions are going to come from the people online. So Hakan, will you, because I can't see them. Uh, 
Not yet, but uh, so I would like to start with a question. So you said that the the fault line is basically located uh, like a kilometer from Tel Achana and Tel Tayanot. So either you or Tel uh, Tayanot, did you actually find indications of measures that they took in the past to protect themselves against earthquakes? Yeah, this is. This is a question that we have been also thinking quite a lot even before the earthquake. Uh, but from a personal experience, I would say that it's very hard to understand, uh, especially what type of damage earthquake creates in mud brick architecture when you excavate them. So I always stay a little skeptical on this side. And for example, when you look at there's monuments with all these big artistats. You can clearly see that they're, they are like wobbling, so it seems like they're affected. But now that I showed you all these root problems yes. at the site, probably all these wobbling effects that we do see in the architecture is likely created by these wild plants. So it's not easy to jump into the conclusion of an earthquake. But in terms of architecture, and when we look at the late Bronze Age uh, architecture, what fascinates me is not particularly those two palaces, but when we look at the late Bronze Age, final late Bronze Age levels, there are these massive fortress complexes built by Hittite engineers, yes. mm -hmm. and all seems to have uh, a casemate style, which seems to be, in my perspective, when you're building like a casemate wall with uh, internal sections filled with uh, the soil, I think it creates a little, gives a flexibility to the building so that the building during an earthquake can expand in multiple directions. But apart from that, when we look at other engineering details, it's hard from my perspective to say that they did this to, to fight or like to take some precautions for earthquake. At least I'm not able to read this at the current condition of the site. I mean, mud brick itself has a certain amount of elasticity. Definitely, well, of course, definitely. So, so, uh, so, but when we look at, I mean, even when you compare, like the whole argument in this lecture is that, okay, the earthquake affected the monuments that we have, but the major reason is because those monuments were exposed to all natural conditions for yeah. hundred years. But even in that, when you look at the damage, yes, there is damage. But I can say that uh, they stand pretty strong to this such a big uh, earthquake. It's still like they're standing in there, that's it. Indeed. I mean, they looked very well at the end of the, very good at the end of the, of the end season. Of the, at the end of the season. Uh, we have uh, two questions online now. Uh, one is coming from Zeynep uh, from Nepal. Uh, the question is, are there concerns of changes in stratigraphy caused by the earthquake or its uh, soil liquefaction or from the plant infestation? Uh, soil liquefaction for a tile site is like, no, there's no such thing. I don't think we can even, uh, I don't think we need to think about that. The more damage is uh, from the plant infestation, I would say. so. And because we are a tile site also, we are roughly uh, from the land surface, like we are like around 15 meters high. So in fact, it's more solid than its surrounding. Uh, another one from uh, Arie Amaya. How would both the earthquake and the restoration reparation uh, work potentially influence the understanding of precise chronology at Palachana in the future? Uh, our potential understanding of sites chronology or, hmm, well, I mean, the research will continue. So we will continue to work on the site chronology, but like what we foresee right now in terms of our future plans is next five years will be dedicated to less excavation and more uh, this type of preservation and heritage presentation efforts. I have another question completely different, more heritage related. So you said that uh, local communities are not really uh, supportive. Uh, but now has this whole catastrophic events and the fact that you and your excavation team did so much, 
has that changed anything today? Because I, I think that you had local um, people working with you as well. No? So is there more understanding of the importance also? Or? I, I mean, maybe in the coming two or three years, but not right now, because as I said, concerns are in a very different direction right now. So like, uh, and it's perfectly normal. Yes, so, of course. But, uh, so not right now, I yeah. would say, not right now. Any other questions? No, it was very clear in the lecture. Thank so, you. therefore, uh, thank you very, very much and good luck. Uh, I mean, I can imagine that a, an eight month uh, season is killing. Uh, it, was it was really, I, I, there is another question now. So, let's also take that one. Yeah. Uh, I'm from uh, Francesco Morosi. Thank you very much for that. Uh, your and your team's dedication and work is very important. And it also shows well how archaeologists working in the field do much more than scientific work. Working in the field creates a human and social network. And I can imagine that in such a dramatic phase, these ties have become even stronger. Do you think that uh, this experience might bring local community to change its approach and participation in your work? Has it already happened? It's not happened yet, but this is what we really would like to foresee uh, for the future. Because right now, I think, uh, not just specifically for Achana, but for in terms of keeping and preserving the cultural heritage of a region that is severely impacted, uh, this just cannot be done only by uh, authorities, but it needs community engagement and local endorsements. Otherwise, uh, our efforts will not be uh, satisfactory. Yeah. Or sustainable. Or sustainable, yeah. definitely. Okay, thank you very thank much you. again. And uh, so we are going on to a small reception now. And okay. thank you everybody who uh, listened to the lecture online. And keep uh, an eye on the BIA announcements because we have various busy seasons of events coming up. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.